Mary is a fantastic person to talk with us about this issue of writing blocks because she has so much empathy for those with writing writer's block. As we've talked in preparing this session, um, she's written rather a lot herself and so she's been in this situation a lot. She's got particular empathy for PhD students. Um, her own PhD was about how postgrads developed their use of sources not cooking sources. As many of you well know, she's a leading light in the area of academic writing at Brooks. She's conducted research into areas such as the use of formulaic phrases, understanding plagiarism and how to demystify the writing process. Um, some of you here today are lucky enough to be taught academic writing by Mary as she teaches pre-master students in the Oxford Brooks Business School. So now we will all share that pleasure, staff and students alike, of being taught by Mary, <laughs> at whatever level we're writing at, whatever purpose we're writing for. Um, so I will hand over to Mary now and, and look forward to um, all of our exchange of ideas and all of our contributions in thinking through this uh, question of writing blocks. Over to you, Mary. Okay, thank you very much, Kirsten, and welcome everybody to this workshop. Um, I'm aiming to give you some strategies today for dealing with um, writer's blog, but also hopefully to inject some positive energy into your writing, whatever you're doing. So um, I'm going to share my screen, first of all. So maybe for some people, um, uh, as in this uh, cartoon from Calvin and Hobbes, uh, writer's block is simply a kind of a, 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 a the feeling that there's this great big block between you and your ability to write. More conventionally, if we turn to the work of Rowena Murray, um, who I'm a big fan of, uh, she's a kind of writing guru, um, who wrote a, a handbook with uh, Sarah Moore, and explain some of the feelings that people have when they have writer's block. So they talk about the agonies of getting down to it, um, feeling that it is a difficult and unpleasant process, not knowing what to do, feeling that it's overwhelming. And these are obstacles which may be real or may be imagined. But I would say that um, writer's block is an extremely common problem. In fact, we probably all have it at times. Um, we can't sort of escape it, but what we can do is develop some strategies to deal with it. And that's really the focus for today. stop you there. Some fantastic um, points coming in, really important blocks. I noticed one about perfectionism um, and a really uh, creative and interesting uh, strategies for unblocking. Um, I'm glad to say I am covering some of that in this session, but we may well need another session for all of these strategies. So thank you very much. Hopefully that's now got you really thinking, okay, what um, what are the blocks for you or the ones that you know about and what are the strategies that you know about? I'm now going to uh, present um, the blocks that I've chosen to focus on in this session. And, um, and then with each one, as I said, I will um, make some suggestions 
for um, unblocking. I consider um, the first block uh, to think about is not having appropriate words, not having the words that you need in order to write. So this is kind of the blank screen syndrome. Um, you, you feel perhaps your words aren't adequate, uh, you don't have the academic language, um, you don't know how to articulate it, um, and you don't know what academic writing looks like. Now, whether um, English is your first language or not, I think the problem is actually that academic English is no one's first language. And that's a famous quote from Bourdieu and Passeron. I didn't make it up. But, you know, I think everybody has to learn um, academic English in order to write um, in the appropriate way. And um, the first strategy I would offer uh, for that is to go to Academic Phrase Bank. Academic Phrase Bank is a resource that is freely available to everybody and was developed at the University of Manchester. It's um, considered some a, a, a way of having nuts and bolts to kind of put your writing together. And I'm going to look at it in a bit more detail in a moment, but I also wanted to mention the work of Helen Sword, who wrote um, a book about stylish writing. And she advocates smart sentencing, which is looking at the specific words that you use to make sure that they have a clear focus and purpose. And I think could be very helpful to finding um, appropriate words. Um, I've actually done quite a lot of research with the creator of Academic Phrase Bank, John Morley at Manchester. And um, in our research, participants told us that uh, the Phrase Bank actually did specifically help um, with uh, problems um, overcoming writer's block. So having the phrases in front of them uh, really did help. And um, a learning support staff participant suggested that it's a way of uh, helping the penny to drop, in other words, to really understand how you need to write. Um, the work of Phrase Bank and providing a, a list of phrases actually connects with the Sapar uh, Wharf um, hypothesis, which if you haven't heard of, is um, the idea that the language that you have at your disposal influences your thinking. So uh, an example from the Academic Phrase Bank, um, it's organized in two ways, in both the uh, sections of a research paper and language for functions. So if you look at language for introductions, the functions that you can see here on the right, synopsis of literature, highlighting absence or scarcity of research, etc., um, they um, you, you then get a list of useful phrases that enable you to fulfill that function. Now, all of these phrases are sentence stems or starting points for, for a sentence. So that um, by having these first words, you can then hopefully continue and build up a sentence um, because you've got the starting point. The words are beginning to go across the page and this um, it should help in order to, uh, to build up sentences. Moving on to block number two. So I think one of the uh, problems uh, or barriers to writing is not knowing how to structure an academic writing text. So how to set it out, what goes in the beginning, middle and end, how, how to make it clear to the reader, or even at the paragraph level, how to make a good paragraph. And you may feel a bit like this signpost, um, kind of lost in every direction. So strategies for dealing with this. One thing I would say again and again, start by breaking the whole into sections. So whatever that whole is, if it's a PhD thesis, if it's a paper, a chapter, a section, even a paragraph, break it down, break it down into smaller parts so that it becomes more doable. 
And um, one way to, to help with that structure is to look at the rhetorical moves. So the kind of functions within um, a structure. And John Swales um, created something called the CARS model, uh, creating a research space where there are three moves. So the first is establishing a territory, meaning um, work out what your research context and area is. Then move two is establishing a niche, meaning uh, deciding exactly what the gap is, the, the area that hasn't been uh, covered in that way or in as much detail in other research. And then your third move is to occupy a niche. In other words, to try to um, see a way to fill that gap. So to work on your particular um, focus within um, the research. So um, that's the CARS model by John Swales. Really important um, to help you to structure a text is to think about your signposting. So firstly, um, and secondly, you want to think about sequencing, um, but also certain aspects of your structure, which will enable you to build it up. So think about your overview of structure of the whole of the rest of the text that you put at the end of an introduction. That can help you move forward thinking about what you're going to write about in the rest of your paper. And then um, think about your introductions at the beginning of sections. Again, this can help you to then think about what you're, you're going to write uh, and plan it. Um, your cross references to different sections of the text will also help you um, to connect up um, your, your ideas and your content. And your conclusion needs to refer back. So, um, in these ways, you're already thinking about how to fill in your um, whole text uh, by looking at the, the structure in this way. Um, coming on to paragraphs. So if you're stuck writing a paragraph, uh, particularly a paragraph for a literature review, I think the sandwich structure is quite helpful. Now, I thought I'd invented this, but then I discovered that actually it's quite a common um, sort of a way of seeing a paragraph in which you as the writer provide the bread and you get the filling from sources. So um, you provide the topic sentence, the introductory sentence for um, the starting the paragraph. Then you get your information and evidence from sources that you put next. And after that, Put your comments, your discussion, your uh, evaluation um, of the sources. I think this can help you as a sort of basic structure for um, especially a, a, a literature review paragraph. Moving on to block number three, um, worries about plagiarism. My experience with students has shown me that Sometimes students worry so much about plagiarism, it stops them writing. So this is a comment from research that I did actually um, within my PhD, um, where a student told me how lost they felt and how worried they were about plagiarism. So I think there are various ways of addressing this. Um, I think, it, I think discussion about what you're supposed to do is a really good starting point. So discussion about what's acceptable or not acceptable. Um, what do the breaches, um, academic conduct breaches or plagiarism, what does that mean? And I do um, advocate the formative use of Turnitin for checking source use. So using Turnitin at a formative stage. At the same time, I would want to strongly put across the message that uh, you should avoid relying on the Turnitin overall similarity score to decide whether um, a decision uh, to, or to make a decision about whether a text is okay or not, because the overall similarity is not necessarily equal to um, plagiarism. And there's more about that in the book that I co-authored with Kate Williams, who's also 
in this session. Um, that's the referencing and understanding plagiarism uh, text. Um, paraphrasing, obviously to help you to, with these concerns about uh, plagiarism, um, good paraphrasing techniques are really important, thinking about how you write um, from a source text in your own way. So remember that uh, you want to reflect the same meaning as the text, but try to use different words in a different order and include your interpretation. You may also be summarizing and you're likely to be including your critical response to the text. In relation to this and um, what I was saying before about uh, plagiarism, I'd like you to consider the difference between a literature review and a literature repeat. So if you look at this image, uh, in um, the case of a literature repeat, the article is basically just being copied and the writer is not doing anything except copy. In the case of the literature review, which is what uh, you want to do with sources, um, the information is coming from the article going into the writer's head. They're thinking about it and then writing in their own way. So that's a very basic model, but just something to think about, um, especially if any writer feels what they're writing is too close to the source that they're using. Um, there's not enough of themselves in it. Their voice is not coming through. So th maybe think about that model. Okay, I'm moving on to the more sort of emotional blocks now. So the, this fourth block that I'm um, going to talk about now um, is about feeling under pressure of time. So it's the time issues, but procrastinating. So putting it off, uh, taking too long to get started. So the situation where the deadline is looming, but you can't make your time productive. And that may be because you're spending a lot of time with easy short tasks and uh, putting off the long and difficult. That's a kind of human instinct, unfortunately, to do that. Um, and perhaps the clock is on fire. Um, but uh, I wanted to tell you about a concept that a student from Thailand introduced me to, which is Miracle Night, um, where um, a, a, a writer, in this case, a student has to um, produce work um, on the night before a deadline um, that they want to be perfect and brilliant um, and submit it in the next morning. Um, of course, there is no miracle night because writing is a process and you can't do it quickly and at a deadline. So um, it's really important to develop strategies for time management. So one of the ideas that I really like comes from Rowena Murray and Sarah Moore's book, and it's about writing snacks and feasts. This is the idea that you can make a productive um, time out of a short period as well as a long period. So a writing snack would be where you fit it in between other things, but you still make it very productive. And a writing feast is where you can obviously dedicate more time and energy um, to your writing. I think the problem for many very busy people is that you can't keep waiting for the feast. You know, you, you want to block out a big amount of time, but it may not work in your schedule. So if you can make use of writing snacks, short periods of time, maybe half an hour, where you can um, fit in some productive writing that can be very useful. I also really like the idea from Zara Bavel that you should think about two factors that influence the productivity of your writing. So take into account the amount of time that it takes you to get into a creative mode. So how long do you spend faffing? You know, when you are uh, planning to start writing, um, how long do you spend getting distracted by emails, social media, or checking the news or something? Um, and then how long can you sustain a creative mode? So how long can you keep going 
um, without taking a break. And I would recommend to you to find out both of those things for yourself. You know, how do you work? Because we're all different. What's important is that you're aware of how you work best. So um, how long you need to get into a creative mode and how long you can sustain it for. Um, you may also like to make a plan like a, a brilliant previous student of mine did using a Gantt chart, um, mapping out how long each section of a paper might take um, using uh, this sort of system with dates, um, knowing then um, that more time is needed for certain sections of a paper. So doing that sort of planning may work for you. Moving on to the next block. This one is about feeling isolated. And I think that's particularly important at present. You might feel as a writer that you're really on your own, that um, perhaps no one else is interested in your writing. It feels a very solitary activity. Again, I know when I started my PhD, a friend told me, you will spend years of your life alone in a room. Um, I tried to avoid that, and I'm going to share some of my strategies. They are really to plan and communicate. So I think talking about writing is really helpful for everyone. I have included here, if you talk to friends as a student, please don't collude with them. But I think talking is a, a, a very good starting point. So talking about an assignment, not actually writing it together, but talking about it. Having a writing buddy, someone else who's writing, um, maybe doing a similar sort of writing to you and someone you can exchange with. Um, get a critical friend. So that person is someone who could read your writing and give you a bit of feedback in an honest way, but a friendly way. Um, that's really helpful for, for PhD writers as well, I think. Um, how about a diary with some dates for writing checkpoints, you know, what you're going to have done by a certain point, and, and you might share that with someone else as well. Um, discuss writing um, with, with a tutor or a colleague. Um, read some blogs about writing. That can be quite encouraging. Um, and don't forget about these brilliant Writing Hub events. Uh, such as um, the one you're attending today. I'm not saying that's brilliant, but um, uh, it's a great initiative to join the Writing Hub um, events. And um, also there's the Centre for Academic Development, and I'm really happy that lots of members of the Centre of Academic Development are here today. So that's where um, students will find many sources of support. Moving on to the last block I'm going to consider in this session. So you might be feeling overwhelmed and unhappy about writing. And this really creates a block for you. So this feeling that you just can't do it, it's too much. Again, I know I felt like that with my PhD. I've often felt like that with different writing publications when I'm trying to get into a quite high ranking journal. It's incredibly um, hard and you do feel really overwhelmed that it's just too much for you. It's a very common feeling, I think. So some, first of all, some suggestions from um, Rowena Murray and Sarah Moore. Um, try to demystify the academic writing process. So um, find ways of um, feeling less overwhelmed, actually understanding the writing process. And Farrell and Tai Mooney have done quite a lot of work on this. Uh, again, breaking down the academic writing process and, and products, understanding the different aspects of writing, how it's marked, what's important, how to draft and redraft. Um, and then think about other kinds of writing. So um, some ideas here, firstly from Frank and Rinvalukri, start creating a writing climate. So if you're finding the writing, uh, the main writing difficult, perhaps try first of all, some easier kinds of writing. That might be a creative kind of writing. Um, it might be quick writes. So um, in other words, writing on an easier topic or also advocated by Rowena Murray and Sarah Moore, do some free writing. Um, this 
can help people to write more quickly and stop procrastinating. So a, a free writing task would be where you just decide to write for five minutes without stopping. You don't think about mistakes or um, making revisions, just write. Um, and having a bit of time where you just do that might help you to um, get started and build towards more uh, writing. And then um, on this slide, I've got some suggestions for enjoying the writing process more. So if we start with mindfulness. Now I'm a, fine, a fan of uh, mindfulness, but you don't have to sit on a table cross-legged um, and meditate if you don't want to. Uh, mindfulness is also about just taking a positive uh, approach um, to perhaps doing some uh, deep breathing uh, to relax you before starting. Um, but um, I think it, has a, a, it can have a very positive effect on uh, your writing. Um, I'm also a fan of the Alexander Technique. I wonder if you've ever heard of that. Um, it's a means of improving your posture for whatever you're doing. So do you tend to sit like the red person here, kind of hunched over or slouching? Um, because if you try better posture, sitting more upright, so one way to do this, I can't fully demonstrate because I'm not in a classroom, but if you sit on your hands, immediately, if you take them out again, this can realign your spine. So try sitting on your hands. Um, you can move forwards and backwards, and then your spine will be a bit more um, upright. And it's surprising how much relief that can give you, because we all get bad backs from sitting hours trying to do writing. Um, and I think if you sit more upright, um, you may feel actually a bit uplifted, more positive, and that will help your writing. Um, somewhere different to write. Now, of course, we can't just go to the beach at the moment, or perhaps at any time, but perhaps you can find a different place to write, um, a different room or a different part of the room, um, or maybe slightly change your writing space, you know, um, have some flowers or a different mouse mat or um, any sort of decoration that makes you feel a bit more positive as if you've made a positive change to your environment. Um, this could kind of spur you on and help you. I'm also a fan of treats to get into the mood for writing. So, you know, um, whether it's coffee, cake or surrounding yourself with music, um, my personal favourites, I seem to write best with Mozart and mint tea. But I suggest that you find your formula. You know, what is, um, what are the things that help you to feel positive about writing? And once you have this association, so once I've turned on Mozart, got my mint tea, I have an association with trying to be productive with writing. I won't say it always works, but it it's a strategy to try out if you haven't already. Certainly some certain things seem to help uh, people to um, get more into the mood and that's what you're aiming for. Okay, so um, yeah, using all of these strategies, hopefully you will experience the flow, the magical flow of writing that Rowena Murray talks about here because writing really can be enjoyable when you've got everything in place that makes you feel positive about it and it's going well. So just to summarize what I've gone through, writer's block can occur due to many cognitive and affective factors. That's the practical and, writing, uh, and emotional blocks that I've talked about. I would say, accept that this happens, but try to have some strategies ready for overcoming writer's block. And those strategies that I've presented are to check some phrases or use smart sentences, break down the text, follow a structure, check your understanding of academic conventions, work on time management, communicate with other writers, 
try and demystify the process, try different kinds of writing tasks, and overall relax, do some positive mind building and getting in the mood. Um, regarding checking phrases, um, most people went for useful rather than very useful. So that was 46%. The breaking down the whole text into sections was really popular. Um, so 67%, uh, uh, two thirds of us went for very useful. So that was clearly um, a, a particularly good strategy. Um, checking your understanding of academic conventions to avoid plagiarism was more split between the three. Um, that's probably because many people here are staff and they're not thinking about that as much. Working on time management was um, a really uh, popular strategy. So 67% went for very useful. Um, yeah, I think there was just one person who said no, not useful. So time management, really important. Uh, communicating with other writers was um, rated as 56% very useful. So again, quite a popular strategy. Demystifying the writing process was generally considered useful at 56% and relaxing, doing positive mind building, getting into the mood uh, was very useful at 51%. So I conclude that the most useful strategies um, from these uh, seven different um, strategies for unblocking are to break down the whole text into sections and to work on time management. So those two seem to be the most important. Um, I wanted to um, give you a takeaway that um, shows how useful these books are for different um, purposes. So for undergraduate writing, I'd recommend the Cream and Lee book and I've tried to provide the most up-to-date sources um, for these uh, texts. So this is the third edition, 2008. For master's writing, I'd really recommend Swales and Feek. I talked about John Swales' work in the session. Academic Writing for Graduate Students is a very useful book for uh, postgraduate students. For PhD, again, I've drawn a lot on the work of Rowena Murray um, and she wrote How to Write a Thesis. It's a very helpful book for PhD writers. For all writers, and I've uh, drawn on this book quite a lot in the session, The Handbook of Academic Writing by Rowena Murray and Sarah Moore. Writing for publication, I would recommend Rowena Murray's Writing for Academic Journals, very, very helpful text. Now, if you don't want a whole big um, academic writing textbook, the useful pocket books in the Paul Greg Macmillan series, um, of which um, Kate Williams is here in this session, or was here in this session. Um, she's the series editor. So uh, if you just want a short book to dip into for advice about academic writing, all of these are uh, highly recommended. Um, the Getting Critical book is really widely used. Um, and also uh, the book that um, Kate and I wrote together, Referencing and Understanding Plagiarism, is something I've talked about um, in this session. Um, furthermore, some useful books for writing inspiration. So the Frank and Rimbalukri book about creative writing, um, that's for suggestions to get started with writing, but doing easier kinds of writing or different kinds of writing. Helen Sword's book, Stylish Academic Writing, is really useful to help you polish your writing, uh, write in a more effective way. Zara Bevel's book um, is helpful to think about how you approach writing and consider how long it takes you to get into a creative mood and how long you can sustain it. That was a point that I uh, used in the session. And I also really recommend the mindfulness book by Penman and Williams. Uh, they are um, based in Oxford and this mindfulness, a practical guide to finding peace in a frantic world, I think is really useful uh, for writers, but also for coping with life at the moment.